Good evening. Evening. How are you, Mr. Carlson? I'm doing well. Great. Anybody else doing well? All fast today? You Boy, no, no. Yes. What was your question? This is um, on the Zadokai calendar up until sundown. It was Yom Kippur. We had a service last night. We talked about fasting. I went on too long. <laughs> and it was just I'll probably do tomorrow morning. Who knows what calendar people are using these days? Oh, yeah. There's all different kinds of calendars so every person has their own calendar but i think that we have done enough study to get down to an early 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 one certainly earlier than most of the jews use i am happy to say mr carlson or should i call you professor or doctor um not neither of the latter uh Mr. Carlson probably is is good. All right. Well, I thought we wanted to bestow on you. Uh, well, also, you know, doctors mi Mr. is related to Master. So if you want to just call me Master, then that works for me. Okay. But well, I call other people Master. No, nah, but I, I try to follow the... Uh, idea of not taking titles for myself so i uh okay i pretty much go with you know mr carlson pretty much mr carlson would you like to try a question would would i like to try uh asking a question or answering a question answering a question sure I've got if you want a me. lot more in the mail and email since the last time here's a pretty good one why does Paul refer to Peter as Kephas? I'm thinking in Galatians specifically. There's someone he talks to, calls him Peter, somebody else, or maybe the same person, Kephas, calls him Peter again. What do you think on that? Well, um, I've... I had a different idea in the past, and then I've kind of become more undecided on the issue. I, I think um, it, it boils down to a lot of what was the original letters of Paul written in, because uh, so if he wrote his letters in Greek, we'll give that the uh, assumption. That, that's what scholars say. Um, it wouldn't, to me, it does not make sense for the original of his writings for him to refer to, to um, one rendering, Peter, and then another, uh, Cephas. Uh, that, that, to me, wouldn't make sense for the, there to be... Um, it's the same it's literally the same name it's just rendered in a different uh well tell us so what you think now now you you reframed the question several times give us an answer here is it two different people or is it the same person i i'm saying i i can't say for sure because there's there's uncertainty about what he originally said so for me i am certainly of the position that he did not refer to the same individual as with two different names that mean the same thing because both Cephas and Peter mean mean rock um, so I think there's two possibilities one is in the original he exclusively used Ceph or Cephas and changed it or, see, I, I'm not really inclined for this or position here because the or position that I'm going to mention is that 
you know, the one person, the one person's named Peter, but the, there was another person named Cephas. There was actually, according to scripture, there was someone else named Cephas. So there was, there was two different Cephases, um, just like we have multiple James mentioned in the New Testament, which of course, James is not even what the Greek says. Uh, it's Jacobus or something. Uh, Basically, James is a, I think it comes from the French, uh, but it kind of illustrates the point of, like for Cephas, uh, Cephas and Petros. Petros is the Greek. And so, like I said, it just does not make sense to me that he would refer to some of his brothers or fellow believers as Cephas and other of his believers as Petros, why would, why would he use the Greek word? Um, and for one believer, and then a the Hebrew rendering for a different. So I believe that uh, in the original, the, the Israelites, the Jews were referred to by Hebrew names. Um, it's kind of like, Oh, this is a good example. If you actually look in the Septuagint, if you look for Eve's name in the Septuagint, instead of Eve, it actually says uh, in Genesis chapter 2, it says Zoe instead of Hava. You know, Hava is the Hebrew name for, for Eve, but... In the Greek, it translates the name instead as as Zoe, which means life in Greek, Zoe. So that is a parallel example. There's there's other examples too in, in scripture as well as outside of scripture of translators deciding whether to transliterate, which is try to spell it, spell the name in, in their language, or to translate. And it is highly impro in, implausible that Paul would have, uh, well, first of all, Peter, I don't see it as logical the Messiah would have named Simon, which is his original name, would have named Simon uh, with the Greek name Petros. It, to me, that doesn't make sense. There is also evidence that he is called uh, Cephas in some places in the New Testament. So why does it refer in some places in the New Testament to him as Cephas and other places as Petros? And that's just, again, it's um, scribal differences, especially not every book of the New Testament was translated, if you believe the originals in Aramaic, um, not every book was translated by the same group of person. So in one version, you might have it translated um more hebraically in another book you might have it translated more uh for the greek mind so that that to me is the best explanation but in in um i used to think that paul was talking about a different person um in in galatians chapter 2 uh, when he was rebuking Peter, but if you, I, I, my understanding of textual criticism has grown a lot uh, since that time that I've thought that idea, and I'm basically now like, just because there's two different names used is not really compelling because, uh, for example, in the Book of Jeremiah. You have two forms of Nebuchadnezzar's name. You have Nebuchadnezzar and you have Nebuchadrezzar. And actually Nebuchadrezzar is the original version. That's what his actual name is. And Nebuchadnezzar is actually a corruption um, that occurs. And you have other examples of like, for example, Moses' father-in-law in some places he's referred to as Reuel, apparently. And other places he's referred to as Jethro. So is it this, is the same person Jethro and Reuel, or is there a confusion there? 
um, it's the same idea. So I don't think uh, they're two different people in the passages that people are speaking of, Galatians, for example. That's my take. What about you, Jackson? Do you have a thought on that? Here are the scholars' um, uh, opinions. Number one, that when Paul is talking to Peter as a friend, he calls him Peter, Petros. When he's talking sarcastically, he calls him Kephas, which is the Aramaic version. That's one theory. Second theory is that there was two of them, a Petros and a Kephas, and they weren't the same, two different people. A third person is, a third opinion is, there <clears throat> was an error in the writing of that name Kephas, it should be Clopas. Oh, yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure you have. It should be Clopas, and they're at that meeting, he's talking about Petros and um, the brother or cousin of Yahshua, uh, Shimon Clopas. Let's see. <clears throat> Wait, uh, just one question. So you said the, the, the recording had turned off earlier? Say that again. My, my uh, everything went off here all of a sudden, so I missed some of what you said. But I suppose it looks like it's still it's it looks like it's still recording now though. That's good. Yeah, the recording stayed on, but the PA here and everything went off. Oh, okay. I figured you and I were pretty close to the same on this one. I like to think there was a, two of them there. I like to think that Kifa is a different person altogether. And the way you can read it in Galatians is that they, it certainly might be. Because I like to see a little more <clears throat> elucidation about who the disciples were. Who was actually there. We get a little bit of history there, but not a whole lot. Just enough to see that there was some kind of dispute there that kind of broke up the disciples uh, are coming against Paul. And that, those are the main theories that I know of. And I guess we won't know any more until some more of Paul's letters pop up again or some other descriptions of that particular incident. Well, I, I think there's good reason to think it's the normal Peter because of, um, if you look in Galatians, it has the, the, the main three disciples, the apostles, it has a, as like a group, uh, James, Peter, and John, and those are big shot leaders. So I, I am inclined be, because of that to believe that it is talking about the Peter, which, for people who believe Paul, isn't necessarily a. Uh, people will use that as a justification for Paul being an error, but if you think about it. Um, if it's Paul versus Peter, it, it could go either way. Is Paul an error or is Peter an error? Evidently, there was a conflict here, um, but it doesn't tell us the whole story. It doesn't say what happened after the conflict. Right. Because, it, for example, if Peter disagreed with Paul, but maybe Peter later on agreed that Paul was in the right and he, and he admitted it publicly, perhaps. We don't know the full story in that sense. So... It Don't you agree, it open. though? It's about one. It's one of the most interesting passages that is Galatians one, two, and three in the entire New Testament. You want more? You want to see more? You want another witness? We got one side of this thing, and like you said, the biggies are all involved in this, including Barnaba. I want to know more. Well, as we've said, uh, uh, James certainly seems to either be directly replying to Galatians or replying to someone who's in, who is using Galatians as justification. Um, it's, they, are, they have very similar content, so you would think that there is some connection there. Yeah, you might, it might go on to say, uh, at this point, Kephas pulled out a blade and went at Barnaba with the blade. But uh, a wild man 
uh, Therion came out of the woods there and stopped him from using the blade on Barnava, who ran away and Paul ended up flying up in the air. Wow! Then it would be like some of the Apocrypha <laughs> that we read about that's so fantastic. But it's really down to earth. Anybody else on that? People can also share their ideas in the text uh, section. Um, they can comment yeah. if they wish. Um, so what, it doesn't look like anyone wants to say anything about that. Uh, do you, what, what would be our next question? All right. As I said last week, all these questions have come in to me in September. I haven't answered many of them. Let you answer them. Get this one. Were bodies interred in coffins under the altar of St. Peter ad Vincula, or were they just buried in the ground underneath? I'm thinking that the, they're talking about the bones that were underneath the cathedral in Rome, where a couple stories down there was a shoebox with the, and by the shoebox there was a sign that says, Petros Eni. Peter is here with an arrow going down and that shoebox full of bones. What do you think? Um, I don't know much about those things, but I'm, I'm kind of more of a traditionalist in the sense of uh, the Apocrypha accounts, where they say they died and where they buried. Those, my, that's my default belief that those Apocrypha accounts got it right. But you certainly, if evidence comes up that refutes that, I mean, I would be open to the Apocrypha accounts being wrong on that detail. But uh, until proof comes out of where the apostles were buried, then I'm inclined to believe uh, where the traditional accounts say based on the Apocrypha. On the other hand, we do have accounts historically of believers or Christians taking the bones of of people and moving them from their tombs to a new tomb, sometimes in a completely different city. I mean, you even have that in the Old Testament with the, the patriarchs. The patriarchs, um, they, they moved their bones, uh, the, the 12 sons of Jacob, their bones were moved uh, by their descendants to go to the promised land, uh, I believe. So, it, well, there are at least two places where the bones of of Kepha Peter is supposed to be. One is under Rome, uh, under the under the podium of the of the Bishop of Rome, and. He, Indeed, there was a box there with bones in it, and the sign, as I mentioned, bones came out to be mostly animal bones. Then they found an ossuary. Hello? They found an ossuary yeah. Yeah. in Calpiat with uh, the name uh, Sh uh, Shimon Bar Yona on it. So it was right close to the, the next tomb over from the Jesus family tomb there. And yeah, um, some, it was like bargain counter in the time of the Crusaders for relics. And wasn't it like, wasn't there a story where Elijah was buried someplace, somebody fell into the tomb of Elijah that was dying and came out made well. Now I think that was in uh, St. Augustine's City of God or what, one of those. You ever heard of that particular story? I don't think I've well, there, that. well, there's Elisha, um, not, not Elisha, but uh, Elisha, um, according to the Old Testament, when Elisha's body, some, someone uh, was carrying a dead body I think, uh, fell into where Elisha's body was right. and yeah. that rose it from the dead, yeah. Where is There'll that? Be a 
Um, let me uh, look that up quickly. Um, it's in the Old Testament, though. It's in the Book of Kings. It, it, it would be uh, Second Kings. Um, my, my internet's going to give me some problems, so right. maybe I'll look at it on my phone. Okay. Some other okay. So, Anybody what would be the something on that? St. James of Campos, Camposito. St. James is supposed to be at the bone box in the Talpiot place, plus in Spain. It's 2 Kings chapter 4. Okay. Let me see what that says. That is so interesting. Hmm, it says Elisha and the woman's oil. Um, no, wait, that's a different story, yeah. yeah. Different story. Um, I can't remember where that is either. Well, I, I did Google, and I did Elisha resurrection, and I, and I went to that chapter, and I forgot that he uh, resurrected him. Uh, Hold on one sec. Well, why don't you look at the next question while I look this up? All right. Yeah. Uh, it, it's actually Second Kings chapter thirteen. I just. just uh, okay. Two Kings thirteen. And the next question. Somebody ought to call in here and give some fresh questions. Well, you have. You said you had tons of questions there. I do have tons of them, but some of them are. Kind of flaky. <laughs> like the one of uh, did King Solomon smoke? I think we both decided that he did. Well, certainly you can't uh, appeal to him as justification for your for your actions. If you look at the uh, yeah. Old Testament record, he was an idolater. Um, he was promiscuous, contrary to the law, all kinds of things. So, yeah. Well, maybe somebody can look up First Corinthians seven twenty nine. Here's the question: What does Paul mean when he says the time is short in First Corinthians seven twenty nine? So, context there. Which I think actually will go along with uh, one of the questions in our chat. Go ahead. Uh, if you if you read the um, mm -hmm. the question in the chat, that would go along with that. Tell us about it. Well, um, Laura asked, uh, "How long do we have before the tribulation period starts and the return of Messiah?" Okay. What else needs to happen first before these can happen? And lots of people think we are in the tribulation period right now, she yeah, says. They do, but they're wrong. That already happened. Se what, what's it, 7 what? 721? Or what was it? It happened from 66 to 73. The tribulation was from 66 to 70. Well, what was the first Corinthians passage? Oh, I don't know. Somebody looking it up? I, I, I'm looking it up. 7, what was it? 7 what? 729, I think. 29. Yes, okay. Well, we talked about this a little bit earlier, is that um, we don't have the full story when, when Paul's writing things. So, you know, when he says the time is short, he's writing a letter to the Corinthians. But some of the things he's talking about in his letter, it's not always clear what if there's more to the story. So what does he mean by the time is short? Well, something... It's clearly yeah. something in his lifetime because um, he's telling them don't get married. He's uh, married 14 years before the uh, before uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, and he yeah. he prophesies that. Yahshua prophesies that. The Old Testament, the Day of the Lord, prophesies that. So I think that he's talking about the obvious that was happening. The Roman troops are all come in. Uh, they've already been over to the temple once and went away from there. And 
everything is ready to be destroyed, including the temple. But you know, that's I, not, most people don't know the history. There. What do you I think? I think people can confuse the issue and think that it's an either or thing. And I think, I think it can be both. Many times I think people think it's one or the other and they're somewhere in the middle. So in regards to are the prophecies fulfilled in the first century or are they fulfilled in are they yet not yet to be fulfilled? So my take on it is some of the prophecies are very clearly context specific of the of the destruction of the temple in around 70 AD. Right. Uh, but there's other prophecies that don't fit as well that time, whether you account that to a uh, scribal change or error on, on the part of the scribe or the author or if you might believe as I do that some of the prophecies were not intended to be in reference to 70 AD. Some of the prophecies were intended to be at a future time. Yeah, um, yeah. But like some of the ones that are placed in the sky or in the mid heaven, in the spiritual realm, which we couldn't see. But um, as you know, I'm convinced after studying Josephus with Revelation that what happens on earth in the revelation at least has happened and i think john ritter there would would affirm that after he began studying the same thing you just can't say no let's look at it you've got to look at it you've got to listen to other people's opinions and try them out you know that we can't just say it's going to be this way and that's what God says, and I'm going to believe it, because nine out of time, ten times, what happens is nothing like that. So we go back historically to some time when it happened, and certainly with all the warnings Paul has, and in First Thessalonians, in Second Thessalonians, something is about to happen. Now the scholars say that nothing happened, that Paul was wrong, or Paul was a false prophet. Because nothing happened. Well, they too, they need to study history a little more. Because it seems to me like so many things and nearly everything happened in that seven-year period. And if I can go a little farther, doesn't it say at the end of Revelation that if anybody takes away or adds to this book, let them be the curses of this book? Okay, if that's the case, then how can you take a piece of that out and apply it to now. How can you take a piece out and apply it to what's happening now or what's going to happen next week without doing exactly what the warning says not to do? So I'm looking at the uh, warning for a sec. Okay. And let you me know, just uh, look it up here. You know, and, and, the, and the way I'm seeing it <clears throat> now and just from looking at you know the Olivet discourse <clears throat> with Matthew 24 you know uh, and, and then the other gospels is really it looks like it's I mean revelation is the fulfillment of Yahshua's words the warning of what was coming because he does say that um, you know nothing like that been done since the beginning until now nor shall ever be. So, and he says, you know, in this generation will not by no means pass. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and it being a biblical generation of 40 years, uh, and what, he's roughly dying around 30 AD, and the temple being destroyed in 70 AD, that's 40 years. That's strong. So, you know. So a uh, generation in in scripture, a generation is not a set number of years. Uh, that, that's a common confusion people have. 40 um, years in the wilderness, 40 days in the desert, 40 years of uh, Yahshua being resurrected before he flies off. I don't know of another number. That... No, the, the 40 is correct. I'm just saying it's not, uh, that's not what gen a generation is considered in scripture. A generation is, um, is, 
like for example example when uh, in modern times we have we have the baby boomers we have we have the um millennials um these are uh a, a generation is everyone who was born like it, it, it's hard because everyone has a different lineage back back to um back to the uh noah and adam but if you simplify it and say because scripture talks about to the third or fourth generation from you from the person uh, from their descendants. So if you take, if you take, um, let's say you get married and you have a son when you're 20 years old. So your, your son is the next generation. You're the, you're the, you're the first generation of your family. Your children, your, your son is the second generation. Let's say five years later, you have a daughter. She's also in that second generation. Then let's say your son is 20 years old now and he gets married and ha has a son himself. Now that son, which is your grandson, now that's the third generation in your family. But let's say after you have your grandson, five years later, um, or basically let's say your, your, your wife dies. So five years after you have that grandson, you marry a new, a younger woman and you have um, uh, n another child, but you're much older. That child you, you have in your old age is not in a fourth generation or third generation. Oh yeah. Because it's, that child goes and is counted as your second generation, even though, even though there may be 40 years separating your first child from your last child they're in the same generation uh 50 years if you if you know uh, abraham um well abraham had a son when he was 100 years old but let's say abraham had a son when he was 20 years old well abraham lived until he was 100 and whatever 75 or something um after after sarah died he remarried a woman named keturah and had like six kids with her when he was older than a hundred years old, according to Genesis. So if he had a son when he was 20, that 20 year old, uh, that son that he had when he was 20 years old would be in the same generation as his sons from Keturah a hundred years later. So I, I don't know quite where people get the idea uh, in scripture that, a generation equals 40 years or a certain number of years. I think that's more of a traditional interpretation, but I don't really see evidence in scripture setting a number on a generation. That's my take on it. I guess what we're talking about is this particular instance, unless it was just coincident that it was 40 years from the time of the Olivet prophecy until it happened, or it was just, you know, Paul's writing in about 58 or 60, just um, five, six, seven years away. Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls talks about, um, so I believe that, that the Messiah is actually the teacher of righteousness that the Dead Sea Scrolls speak about. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it talks about a 40-year period. It says about 40 years after the death of the teacher of righteousness. Um, it's, I have to look at it again, but it sounds like, from what I remember, that it was saying that after the 40 years, there would be uh, destruction on Israel. Mm -hmm. And we definitely see that. Yeah. Jackson, you would agree with that. I've, I've, heard, I've heard that before from Re one of the- Restate that, would you please? You want me to restate? Yes, in a few less words. Okay, so Dead Sea Scrolls in the, uh, in the Damascus document, yeah has a statement saying that the te after the teacher of righteousness dies, there will be about a 40 year period until the destruction of Israel, basically for judgment to come on Israel. Okay. Uh, I don't remember the specific words of the prophecy, but I just think that that reinforces the idea of a lot of prophecy focusing on 
the destruction of the temple. All right. What if James the Just is the teacher of righteousness? The uh, only way that they can date that stuff is through pe paleography, which is just guessing. The internal history is what we got to look for for the dating. And it's not one or two that believe that James the Just was actually the teacher of righteousness spoken of. And he died somewhere between 42 and 62. Nobody is sure. But that would put that in the same time for Judas the Galilean. He dies in about 1 AD or 4 AD. 60 years from then is the very start of the Neuronic persecution, the Great Tribulation. It's just that we don't have um, a solid dating of any of those passages. But if we look at the internal evidence of the history, we can fit a lot of those into exactly what was happening in the first century. And even like the Habakkuk Pesher, exactly what was going on right. between Paul and James and Kufa and the rest of it. I'm not, I'm not trying to tell you you're wrong at all. I'm just saying we know so little right now and everything we say, we're really just guessing. Does the Bible come right down and say how long a generation is? I think the closest place is there in the Olivet Discourse. And, and you know, I mean, even just now that I've started to just, as I've gone back through Revelation, even just Revelation 1, the words, you know, um, when it says Revelation of, of Yahshua HaMashiach, which Elohim gave to show his servants what has to take place with speed, you know, and then even, oh, uh, and, and then it says to, you know, when John says, he says, I came to be in the Ruach on the day of Yahweh, and I heard behind me a loud voice. So, he, you know, he's coming to be in the Ruach. He was obviously in Patmos, but he's coming and he's writing these things down that had to be, had to take place quickly. And he said that he saw this as he was in the Ruach, in the day and and then it says and then he says write therefore what you have seen both what is now and what shall take place after these mm -hmm. so definitely a lot of sounds like a lot of pre, a present tense a lot a lot of you know a lot of okay something's coming quickly yeah so let me just say for the um for the things like teacher of righteousness, a lot of, of the pressure documents and stuff like that. From my understanding, the those documents assign a very messianic uh, role to the teacher of righteousness. So I believe that because of that, um, I think it's more off, uh, more accurate to apply those concepts to Yeshua since at least from my perspective, I come from the perspective of uh, prior Essene convert slash potential Essene convert in the future because I haven't been living the Essene ways fully uh, for the last few years. But that's because I kind of realized I hadn't fully entered the covenant like I thought I had. Uh, so it's kind of like um, I felt like I wasn't truly in a scene as of yet, even though I thought I was and was trying to live like one, um, I came to the conclusion that I wasn't quite one yet. Um, so, but basically I'm inclined to the Essene beliefs and, and their religion. And so the way I see it, you know, Yeshua is the Messiah and, the, and these documents are assigning Messianic qualities and messianic prophecies to the teacher of righteousness. So I feel, I feel obliged to interpret those messianic statements as referring to Yeshua rather than James. Or uh, I know Laverne's perspective. Laverne thinks the teacher of righteousness is John the Baptist, and of course there's other people who think the teacher of righteousness 
is a title which passes down to different people. Um, so you have different theories, of course. Um, but I do want to say, like, of this topic of, of uh, soon and it coming to pass uh, in their lifetimes, like I said, I think there's some clear prophecies where, where it's undeniable that it's, tr it's intended for the, the destruction of the temple that time period of the first century. But I think what's helpful is looking at the early church. What did the, what did the early church believe? And when I say the early church, I mean before the Council of Nicaea. Because after the Council of Nicaea, you have a general tendency of what you see in the church. Um, so what I mean by this is that the early Christians, they pretty much universally agreed that there was going to be a literal millennium, a kingdom on earth. You see that in the writings of Irenaeus and, and other early church fathers. And uh, one of the most important witnesses, which is now unfortunately lost, but one of the most important witnesses that spoke to this was a man named Papias, who wrote five books. And in his books, he speaks about a millennial period of, of the kingdom on earth. And if you look at the, the Old Testament prophecies, but especially some of these Apocrypha books, like the Book of Enoch, Second Baruch, Second Esdras, all these different documents speak of a special period in the future where there's going to be a little, a literal return of the Messiah and he will reign on earth and have a kingdom. If you take these passages uh, literally, like especially from the book of Enoch, you know, we, we, we place a high value on Enoch in the Ahad, if I understand correctly. So when you look at what Enoch says, there are some striking statements um, about the future that have not yet happened yet in regards to a return to Eden-like quality of uh, the tree of life. We'll be eating from the tree of life again. Um, things like that. Um, it talks about in the parables section of the kings uh, of the earth, the, the rich kings of the earth being uh, gathered up by the Messiah and basically uh, condemned and punished in Arm Armageddon. John, were you going to say something? Okay. Um, I say something. Yeah, well, sure. One of the one of the reasons that there are so little said about it in the church, so-called church fathers, is that a rapture happened in seventy A.D. They were all gone. And the ones that were left over had no knowledge of this whatsoever. And so when, you know, you're getting into some church fathers that talk about it later on in the late second century and third century. But the theory goes that if these people went away in about, you know, uh, 66 to 70, one or the other, then there would be really no knowledge of what happened to him. And the people that were left behind wouldn't be looking around and saying, oh, all these people disappeared. They would have no ability to recognize it anyway. Then the second thing is millennium. There, there's another um, very good theory on that. It's also a preterist theory that you can read about in A. N. Wilson's book on Paul is that the Eastern Empire became the Millennium Kingdom for 1,000 years until the end of the time Satan was let loose at the very end and went through Byzantium. Speaking of the Crusaders, went through the Christians in Byzantium and tore the whole town down, including the great church Hagia Sophia. And that was, as I said, just 1,000 years almost exactly and 
at the end of that thousand years, well, nothing happened until the end. Then these crusaders came in and massacred Jews, Christians, everybody in order to steal their wealth. Just a theory, but an interesting one. I'll, I'll say something else on that. Um, so as we know, the, the Gnostics were very uh, active in the early centuries. And of course, when you say Gnostic, that's a very broad category. But um, you, you had the, the people who were teaching that the, 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 the physical world was evil or a creation of uh, a, a bad creator. And um, see, a lot of the apocrypha documents speak of physical rewards and of, of a, a very much a flesh-focused um, reward concept as well as a kingdom, a, a flesh kingdom, fleshly kingdom. Um, and so when you look at the church writings of around Constantine's time and afterwards, what you see is a tendency to condemn those apocryphal documents because they support a literal kingdom on earth type of thinking. And you see the church moving away from this. And the reason is because, because if there's a literal, if these prophecies are literal and referring to, to the flesh, then that would imply that the law is still in force. Because you got a lot of these prophecies about a future kingdom, which speak very much in the sense of, of uh, the law still being in, in play. Um, Isn't it? It, it, I, I believe it is in, in play, yeah. but the, the church uh, did not agree. So when, they, when the church was seeing that people were taking these prophecies and saying these are literal, people started teaching um, that there's going to be animal sacrifices again. Because you see that in some of the Old Testament prophecies, animal sacrifices in a future time. Um, that doesn't square up with uh, with the church's beliefs. So they were forcing people to have a spiritual interpretation of these prophecies yeah. or in that kind of thinking, these prophecies already were fulfilled in some type of way. Um, You're talking and, about replacement theology here in some sense? Yeah, replacement theology and kind of in that kind of thinking where um, I think that idea that the church in some sense represents the kingdom on earth is comes out of that kind of replacement theology type of mindset. And the Catholic church, I think is what originated that mindset. Um, now, let me just say, uh, we can, this issue, you know, there's people who believe on all different sides. I, I think you'd be, it'd be very difficult to, to be a full preterist, um, if you accept apocrypha books, like if you if you treat the apocrypha books as legit prophecy, because there's a lot of statements in some of these apocrypha documents that doesn't really square well with traditional preterism. But the thing is, people develop these doctrines or these theologies based on very specific books, uh, particular revelation, people place very high a central view on Revelation because it's the only prophecy book in the New Testament. So it's very centralized as the primary foundation for eschatology. But if all these other, you know, there's tons of other apocryphal books claiming to be prophecy. So if some of these other documents are authentic, then it brings other evidence into the table and then um, some of the ideas of preterism might be shown to be incorrect. But the thing to keep in mind is Revelation is its own book. So Revelation, the bulk of Revelation could be talking about uh, the fulfillment in the, in the first century with the temple. That doesn't invalidate these other prophecies that speak of a future fulfillment for something unrelated. Um, like if you actually look at Enoch in the dream in the dream prophecy there's a section where it prophesies of the building of a third temple and that the righteous will gather in this third temple 
with Enoch and Elijah, and then the Messiah will come, it says, and, the, and the everybody will be in the temple in righteousness. So that uh, evidently hasn't happened yet. You could well, say... Well, it might have happened because Yahshua said, uh, I said the temple, my body is the temple. And Paul said something like too, that too, that before long, nobody will rightly worship in Jerusalem because it'll all be torn down. So I'm thinking that maybe they're talking about a temple not made with hands. Well, first Enoch and Elijah... Um, in Book of Enoch, it refers to Enoch and Elijah coming down back onto Earth. Unless they di unless they did that in the first century or something. Um, I mean, we know that according to the New Testament, there was a resurrection of uh, people. In one of the books, what was it, Gospel of Luke? People get resurrected. Uh, like when the Messiah resurrects, other people are resurrected at the same time. Yeah. Um, so maybe Enoch and Elijah came back, but we don't have any accounts of it. Um, but let, let me just say, I was going to say people can have different views on this. Like, you know, it's not like, like what we were talking about the other week. Um, whether you accept Paul or not does not make you like, if you reject Paul, that does not mean you should be put to death kind of thing, you know? And the same goes with eschatology. We have, you know, people can be free to believe what they want. It's not a death sentence. Um, but the question for Laura, I'm going to answer it. Jackson, your answer is correct. Your answer is that uh, this stuff already happened. So there, it's not, not, it won't be happening uh, in the future, right? That's your... I think, well, 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 we've got so much fear and people cashing in. They're cashing in on what is going to supposedly happen, like even in the next year. Okay. And talking to people, putting them in complete fear, scaring them to death. People that are in Yahshua don't need to live in fear like these people do. Well, a lot of these people believe in, um, like the whole rapture thing, I, I think it's a whole misunderstanding. Um, I think the original doctrine of the rapture um, isn't even what you were saying, because you said in the first century people got raptured. I don't even think that is what the scriptures were trying to say when it talked about what whatever that Greek word is, being caught up. Um, yeah. I Har think it... Harpazo. What is it? Harpazo. Okay. Harpazo. I, I, I want to study Greek more and get uh, fluent with it for my Bible project, but... um. Basically, I think uh, when it speaks of being raptured, it's talking about, you know how the flood came and the flood killed everybody on earth, but Noah went into the ark and he was lifted up above the earth. The waters lifted him up into the heavens because in scripture, the heavens is the sky as well as outer space. But so the sky is the heavens. So the waters went so high, if you believe in the global global flood, the waters went so high, Noah was lifted up into the heavens to, to avoid the destruction on the earth. And there's evidence of some of these documents of a second judgment to come of fire on the earth, which will, the fire will basically torch the entire earth. And when that happens, like, you know, when there's a forest fire and when things are torched on the, in the forest, sure. it leaves a it leaves a fresh floor, and that fre fresh floor then is healthier or something. Um, in a similar way, I believe this there will be a global fire which will purify the earth, and that purification will then um, enable the earth to return to Eden-like conditions. And I believe. Right before the fire comes, the rapture will happen where everybody who will be saved from the fire will be lifted up to avoid the fires. And then once the fire destroys everything, they will then be put back down on the earth and live the millennial reign. That's pretty far out. Yeah, because we're, we're definitely not, you know, saying full preterism here, uh, only partial preterism, because Revelation 
20 and 21 with the amelioration, the renewing with the millennial reign, if you want to call it that. Um, and then Isaiah through, what is it, 11 through 19, roughly, Jackson, you can really get a lot of what is to take yeah. place renewing in the with the millennial reign. So, yeah, yeah that's definitely a futuristic event. Uh, not saying that everything's fulfilled, but it's, it, it's you know, um, it, you could almost, the way I've almost started to look at Revelation as not only a um, an apocalyptic text, but a partial prophecy text, but I look at it also now in the eyes of it being a fulfillment of the prophecy of which was the Olivet Discourse from our Mashiach. Um, but yes, because it even says in Revelation right now, what is going to happen now, all this is about to happen and what will come after. So, and then we lose that because we, because uh, Barnabas has been taken away, you know, from out of the Codex Sinaiticus that we have that tells, you know, where they're at, where he is at in time, you know, where they believe they're at in the fifth day and what the last days are. Uh, so we lose a lot of that context when we lose that book right after Revelation. Yep. And I believe in what seeing of Barnabas, Barnabas speaks of a 7,000 year theory where each, each day of creation is represented by a thousand year period of history. And so the theory goes, this theory, by the way, is not just in Barnabas, but it's shared by the early church in general, as well as some of the rabbis, excuse me, the Jews, some of the Jewish leaders have the same idea. And uh, the idea being, if we know when the 6,000th year is, then we'll know when the kingdom comes. And so speaking to what Jackson said, there's a lot of fear and that's not the right way to approach things because if we go by what these apocrypha documents say and things like that, there are clear, unmistakable signs that must come to pass first. And there's no secret rapture that happens before the Messiah was, is to come back. So, um, so you cannot, you should not be afraid. In other words, as long as there's no Antichrist on the scene, you have nothing to worry about. Um, and when I say Antichrist, I mean someone who is literally fulfilling the prophecies of the Antichrist. And there, like I said, there's other apocryphal books which, which attribute specific prophecies to a future Antichrist individual. Uh, so... When you're familiar with these prophecies, you can be, instead of being afraid, you're not, you shouldn't be afraid, you should be prepared, because maybe these documents are fake. If they're fake, well then, then it, those prophecies won't happen. But we study those prophecies in case they're authentic to be prepared. That's what these prophecies are for anyway. It's to prepare yourself for, for trial and tribulation. It's not to tell people you could be raptured at any time and and the end is now type of thing that's it's not really what it's about but that's what people are often using it as you know you we, we've heard these stories every 20 years someone declares the end is about to happen yeah. and people like will will get rid of their life savings they'll they'll get rid of their houses they'll lose everything some people over this and that is just completely contrary to what the scriptures are talking about we're to live, the reality is, when, when is the judgment day? The judgment day for you is what matters, not in the grand scheme of things for you. Because guess what? When you die, you don't have any more repentance. So your, the day of your death is your day of judgment. And that could happen at any time. So instead of worrying about, when the Messiah is going to come back or when the Antichrist, all these things, you should be focusing on your own life spiritually to be, you know, if you have sin in your life, then repent, you know, get it out of your life. You know, I need to draw from those lessons for myself as well. I'm just saying, uh, instead of worrying about everybody else, focus on yourself and, and don't, uh, 
and, and really be afraid for your own salvation rather than something that maybe would happen but probably won't happen so um but in line with the seven thousand year theory when is the year of creation according to the scripture well it's not clear because scripture has been corrupted but based on my studies and you know my studies approach things in a different way uniquely because i use different manuscripts and such in different books i have a arrived at a very specific date which i could be off by a few years but a few years is not a big deal if if my calculation is correct the messiah's going to come back tomorrow no i'm just joking uh if my calculation is correct then i believe the tribulation and all that crazy stuff that people believe is going to happen i believe it's going to happen around the year 2170 AD. So that's 150 years from now. 150 years from now, we will all be dead. It's easy to say that it's going to happen in 250 years because. No, no, 150. 150. 150 Nobody's years. going to witness to that. We're, we'll all be dead. Yeah, we'll all be dead. And so most of these teachers who are predicting when it's going to happen, they'll say, oh, yeah, in our lifetimes, you know five years from now, 10 years from now, maybe 20 or 30 years from now. But without fail, all these people are typically saying it's in their own lifetimes. My prediction uniquely, this doesn't mean I'm right, but it's a, it's a unique difference from all these other false predictors. My unique difference is that I have picked a date that is very far out from my time, and I most likely will not live to see that day. Although I hope and believe that I could maybe live to like, you know, 180 years old if I have faith. But, but uh, that probably is not going to happen. But, you know, anything's possible, but unlikely. So most likely all of us will die and the Messiah will not come back. You can, I, I would bet you everything that I have that the Messiah will not come back before the year 2150. Well, what would you I, say I, if I told I'm you convinced. that I, that Messiah had already come up? <laughs> um, I would uh, say then years is gone. Well, someone has spoken of three comings. I, I've seen some people take speak about three yeah, comings. Not one of those. <laughs> but what, basically, what I would say to you is, uh, well, if that if that's true, then these other books must be corrupted or false uh, on uh, on what they say. Because, you know, it's always possible. You know, I base my beliefs on a bunch of apocrypha documents, but they're not at all of the same level of authority. I acknowledge, you know, a lot of these books have some corruption, major corruptions in them. Uh, so if you're right on that, then the, some of these books must be really messed up uh, in what they're saying. Uh, you know, Jack, people... Jack, explain more about what you say by when you say that he has come. Obviously not. And I mean, yes, at a certain time and extent, because you said of Josephus's wars and things, and then oh, yeah. that would take uh, this whole time up. And I have done that before on podcasts. Yeah, Tacitus and things like that. I think that. I think he's just looking. I think he's just looking for a uh, a brief statement of what you believe in the, when you say he has already come. Not proof of it, but like, what do you mean when you say he has already come? Does that mean he will not come again? Uh, I think that's what he's looking for. What What well, is your thought on that, Jackson? I think that uh, I think that when well, people think that he went up in the air and he's been sitting on a throne up there for the last two thousand years, and that someday he's done interceding for us and he's going to come down and take over the world. I don't think that he's ever left this world, like Enoch, like Metatron, like. Always the, the model of the Son of Man. He lives between the dimensions. He's always here and can move easily between them. Like Paul said, you foolish Galatians, to whom the Savior has been displayed as crucified, he is seen all over the earth. And his angels or his messengers are seen because of that. And so many people have testimonies of, I saw Jesus, or Jesus came to me last night, or something like that. I mean, a lot of these, of, of course, are from crackpots. 
but not all of them. I think that he's here and his hand is moving in government, the governments of this world, and he's setting the world up right now for the ending of evil. You see what's happening in our world? Evil is coming to the fore. In order for anyone to get rid of the evil, they've got to cut the skin open. It's like getting at a cancer. They have to have the evil come out of the pores, so to speak. So it can be rounded up and thrown where, where it belongs. It appears to me that that's what happening is happening right now. People say, as they've said in all generations, that, oh, the, the world has never been so evil as this. Well, my friend, I think the world is more evil now, especially with these revelations about the church, than it ever has been. You can't go into a church, for instance, for instance, with children and think you're going to be saved. You can't. The Say the largest church in the world is so full of scandal, so full of drug addicts, so full of homosexuals and pedophiles, that the church, at least that which claims to be the church, is no place for anyone to be. It's dangerous to destroy the lives of children and, and adults who are depending on a clergy that are employed by the devil himself. So is your view that uh, eventually evil will be destroyed and rooted out? Like what's your, mm -hmm. for the future? Like, do you, so how do you think that happens? So basically. Well, okay. When he speaks about the end will come, this goes back to all those prophecies about the day of Yah, the day of the Lord when Jerusalem will be destroyed, when the earth will be set back into a paradisical kind of a place. And when that is explained in the scriptures, especially in some scriptures that have been thrown out of the Bible like Barnabas, what we're talking about here is the end of, not the world, it never ends, says Paul, the end of evil, the destruction of evil and all evil in the world and the destruction, utter destruction of sinners in order to restore again the sacred vow that we find in the book of Enoch, the vow to creation, that yes, creation will be restored by the sons of Elohim, the Ben Elohim. That's got to be coming forth because of the huge uh, tidal wave of evil in our days. Look, for instance, unlike any other time in our governments, in the United States government and those wishing for government, have you ever seen such a flock of empty bags of skin and bones filled up with malevolent demons as you, ha as you do now? Take a look at the parties in the United States. When I see somebody like Beep, beep. I can just see through them and see there's nothing in there but evil only. Evil intent, um, corruption, grasping, simony, bribery, and immorality. Thank you, thank you. Do you ever do you ever feel that if you're in touch with anything that's going on in this world and especially in this country how can you not see that i i yeah i mean i think they are very it's got to come world of, yes so you're saying that the that the righteous will put an end to it or do you think or do you think there will be some catastrophic uh act of God that will put an end to it. Well, what I hope is, as I wrote several years ago, that one day Congress is in, a se in session <laughs> and Yeshua walks into the congressional chamber 
and says, hello, everybody. I'm taking over. I'm taking over. And for, you, you remember the late Senator Edward Kennedy? He says, Ed, you've been a Catholic, a good Catholic all these years, and I have something for you in my kingdom. I want to make you the deputy sheriff of Dothan, Alabama. It's a perfect place where you got a little window and a desk there, not much to do. And now, you know, it's a, it's a little thing, but it's a big, big job. I think you'll be good at that. Go down below. Yeah, I believe he's going to come in and simply take over. That's what I hope anyway. Okay. And it'll happen in a very quick order. Just like, for instance, the, uh, the election of Trump was never considered possible. I'm not saying that Trump is any more evil or better than anybody else. I'm just simply saying there was a revolution in this country then when the people finally simply got sick of it and wanted to clean the swamp. Well, perhaps when Yahshua comes with his myriads and his kindly ways, he will very literally clean the swamp. That's what I think. I hope. What's funny is this year I have uh, I have made a. St um, you guys have probably heard of a document called the Divine Comedy. It's a it's a document from the Middle Ages written by a, an Italian writer. Divine Comedy. I think it uses an older sense of, of the word comedy, not to be yeah. humorous, but it's a different meaning. But in many ways, I feel like 2020 is God's sense of humor because this year has been completely crazy. Um, all kinds of curveballs and unexpected events happening. It really seems like this stuff, like, you, for, you know, there's people out there who still believe that God doesn't exist, but this year is some good evidence that Something else is out there, yeah. Matt, because this has just been a crazy year, and with all kinds of stuff like that, doesn't seem like it could happen by itself. It seems like there's, like you you wonder sometimes. Like I've wondered in scripture, like, like does God have a sense of humor? And maybe maybe He sets things up in a way that sometimes causes us suffering, but is for His own entertainment. Sometimes I wonder that. Um, and I, I could see stuff happening this year where God is just playing with us, like messing around with us, uh, but in a way that like, um, brings him joy, but also is like a lesson to us mm -hmm. and, and like very good trying to teach us to repent type of thing too. So it, it accomplishes two purposes. One he finds it funny, but two, it's also important to try to get us to repent. Um, so he accomplishes both purposes, to make himself laugh, as well as to um, to try to lead people to repent uh, and to show evidence that he is there. Like, he's de he's designing things behind the, behind the scenes, I think, Pull pulling strings. Although some people think that it's not God doing that. They, they think it's um, the elite or, you know, people behind the scenes, uh, a secret group of people who are making all these decisions. Uh, there's some people who believe that. Uh, anyways, I, I did want to say something that you said that I agree with, and that is... Um, there's a pack for documents as well as the New Testament, which speaks of after the Messiah, you know, there was the 40 days after he rose from the dead, he ascended into the heavens. And you would think, oh, he ascended into the heavens. And then it says, what was it? The 40 days you're talking about? That yeah. He's preaching. Okay. 40 days after he rose from the dead, it says in the Acts that he ascended into the heavens. And then it says, you will not... Uh, you will see me again coming from the clouds, whatever, in the same way or something. Mm -hmm. But 
in not, in other documents it says after he ascended he was still appearing to them for one and a half years um teaching them things secretly and and appearing to people like appearing to the apostles randomly and teaching them extra stuff like at random times but people might not believe that that's true but you have it in the book of acts where if you accept paul the Messiah himself appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. This was after he ascended into the heavens. So now you have, supposedly you have the Messiah back on the earth appearing to Paul. Oh, we mean he got off of his throne? Exactly. So, I agree with you, sure. So I think that kind of reinforces what you're saying. Um, but I believe very much that... I believe there's evidence that the Messiah was equated with uh, Yahweh and that, you know, Yahweh isn't just sitting on his throne. He is active on the earth as well. So I think, I know people might disagree with identifying Messiah as Yahweh, but uh, if he is, it would support also the idea of him not being just sitting on the throne up in heaven somewhere. He's clearly active on the earth. Um, so there's not too much time left, but, uh, did you want to say anything else on this topic or did you want us to move on to another question? Yeah, let's go on like to a one small, more. small yeah. question. Why don't you pick a, a less de a uh, less deep, uh, one? Yeah, this is a good one. Is the long ending of Mark added to increase harmony between the gospels? Or is it written by Aristion and therefore reliable? Let me just say there are at least three, perhaps four endings to Mark. And usually what your Bible is going to have is the long ending, though it's not the earliest ending. And Aristion is mentioned in first century, late first century literature as one of the twelve. Aristion. So I don't know where they get the idea that the ending of Mark is written by Aristion. But let's, let's see what you think about the long ending of Mark. Uh, to, uh, you want to go first? And, and snakes. No. <laughs> no. See, Mark is a, okay, Mark is a gospel where the disciples are entirely unreliable. They're failures. There's a messianic secret going on there where uh, Yahshua was saying, don't tell anybody, my time has not come. And nothing besides some pretty great deliverances go on throughout Mark. And then when you get to the end of the last chapter, which usually is thought to end in chapter 16, verse 8, concerning the disciples, for they were afraid. Then on the end after eight are tacked on one of a number of different endings. Of course, the longest ending is the one that all of a sudden the disciples are no longer big failures, but they are uh, supermen. They can go forth and drink poison and handle snakes and heal everybody and raise the dead, and that you can too. Of course, none of these endings seem to be the right ending. Check it out sometime. So you study Bible, all four of them will be in there. So you think none of the endings are correct? No, I'm saying, I guess I don't know. What I'm saying is none of them fit the profile of the rest of Mark. And the, the best and earliest texts stop at verse 8. For they were afraid. That's the end of it. Yeah. I don't know so, if anybody has a Bible that can read those endings or not. So my, my take on it is uh, that the short ending is the correct one. I would um, probably say that one too. I didn't use the think that, but you know, you with, with my... With my beliefs uh, with textual criticism and such over the years, I'm definitely inclined to that. Basically, if you look here, let me see. Um, I mean, like uh, the a lot of the early manuscripts don't have 
uh, the long version. Um, now, a majority of manuscripts have the long version versus nine to 20. Mm -hmm. um, but the other version, um, well, here it says in one Armenian manuscript, it says that it is by Ariston, yeah, the, the elder, and that is uh, that is based on what Papias says. So I'm inclined to actually agree with that idea that it is Papias who that I believe that story is authentic, but it's it was not part of the of the Gospel of Mark. So I don't think it's false. I just think in terms of textual criticism, it should not be included as Gospel of Mark. Well, Similarly, one is a uh, first century edition. It's by Ephraim the Syrian. And I can't remember which one. It may be the second shortest one. I don't know whether your Bible there tells you where they came from. I no, I'm not I'm not familiar okay. with it, with it. Yeah. Um I I think uh the same thing with the story of, from the Gospel of John of the adulteress, uh, the stoning of the adulteress woman. Uh, they tried to stone her, and he said, yeah. uh, he is without sin, cast first stone. Well, that's the evidence is overwhelming that that was not part of the Gospel of John, but, but there's evidence that that story is authentic from Papias, we see. And... We so it was part. It in, I think we find it in the uh, papyri, the Oxyrhynchus papyri. Oh, we may. I don't know. That was um, quite early, but no, it was in John and Luke, and it moved around. And where did it end up in John eight? John eight. Uh, jo between John seven and John eight, but it's not only there. It's also some manuscripts have it at the end of John. Some manuscripts have it in the Gospel of Luke. Um, not many manuscripts, but some do. Mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of like the Book of Daniel in the in the Septuagint. In the Book of Daniel, you have three editions. Two of them, I think, are not part of the Book of Daniel, and they should not be included in Daniel. And that's the right. Susanna story and the. Bell and the Dragon story. I believe those stories are scripture and authentic. I just think they were not originally part of that book. They were originally part of a lost apocryphal book. But they someone someone took those sections and decided to take them out from that ap apocryphal book and put them in the book of Daniel for whatever reason. Yeah. Well, they're in Greek too. Uh, yeah. Aramaic and Hebrew. Yeah. Um, so Jackson, uh, this is a little bit unrelated, but uh, did you see that document I made recently that I shared on Facebook? It was um, it is uh, my my memo from my Bible project thing. Yes, I did. In fact, I think that I made a comment on there. That's like a, a lifelong project, not something. Yeah. Did Did you get it? Did you get a chance to read through it, or some of it, or how? I've read it before. You've had that for a few years. Well, but that's I, I made a document with my most updated uh, uh, ideas and. Okay. Yeah, I'll look at it. No, I didn't see that. It's it's so it's forty pages. The first twenty or first half is like textual criticism. The second half is just me telling you about my pl my plans for different books. So, okay. um, I think I think you'd find it interesting. Well, let's talk about that next time. If you want, we can. I'd love to. Any so any final thoughts, guys? Do you have any other? questions? Like very very brief questions. Anyone who's on right now, we still have uh, let's see, five, five people, five six people on, or seven people on, or something. Um. So, does anyone have any final thoughts? There, there was the 
Joseph Arimathea question earlier. Yeah, uh, that, I don't, that up next time too. Yeah, Jackson, uh, he has a lot to say about that, I think. Oh, yeah, I do. <laughs> Have you guys uh, ever – It looks like – what was it? Have you guys ever thought about the Joel 2 and the Sixth Seal when it says the great and terrible day and talks about all the mountains and islands being moved out of their place? That hasn't happened yet. Well, it depends on – it depends on how you interpret that it hasn't happened. You're talking about Joel 2? Yeah, it says the great and terrible day. That's the day of Yah, the day of the Lord spoken of in Hosea and Nachum and a couple others, Zephaniah. And um, I would say, yes, it has happened. And I can probably put my finger on it for you, but you don't have to believe me or think that I'm, uh, I'm insane or something like that. It's because I just find I it very... I just find it very interesting that it talks about how the sun will be dark and the moon turn to blood and the six seal yeah. says the same thing. Let's take a look at it. Put it down for next time. Okay. Now, Jackson, you might you might be insane, but not for that reason, for different reasons, you know. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean it's the syphilis. Tertiary yeah. syphilis. Um, I'll say a final thing of what was just brought up. Basically what I want to say is from my studies there's a lot of passages in the Old Testament where it's not really clear if it's already been fulfilled or if it's a future to be fulfilled. The reason for that is because a lot of these prophecies make more sense as being fulfilled in that prophet's day uh, or within a few centuries. But sometimes uh, the scholars say that these prophecies don't always add up, line up with history. So is the booking correct or is our understanding of history wrong or was the prophet talking about something that hasn't yet happened yet so sometimes it's not always clear and both ideas are possible interpretations so um i would have, I would have to study the joel thing but as you know at least from what i've said i'm definitely open to joel what joel said in that passage still having a future fulfillment but we should take a look at it and see is there any possible uh, event in the past which could fit it? And Jackson has gone through a lot of history and he believes he has found a lot of events in history that match up with most of these prophecies in Old Testament. So maybe, you know, as we said, maybe next time Jackson could share yeah, more on that. Yeah, that would be real helpful to me as, as well as maybe other people who could see a different point of view. What I find interesting is when you study the the feast, there's multiple fulfillments, just like Passover. Um, and then you see Pentecost. Pentecost is when the, the commandments were given out. It's also when the, the fire was up on the mountain. I mean, I just find interesting how there's multiple fulfillments. Uh, it's not like it just happens once and it's done deal. Do you like have a, a list of, what you read about the fulfillments there, that would be really helpful. For, for the festivals specifically, you mean, Jackson? Well, we know how the festivals were fulfilled in Yahshua's life, but I'm thinking of these other minor oh, for, kind of things like the sun turned to blood and the and the mountains flying off and that kind of thing. And yeah, that'd be cool to see. Yeah, if you have something like that. Yeah, there, there's definitely an opportunity for multiple fulfillments this is the final thing we'll say because we have to go uh the time is about up um for today's meeting but um there's it's very clear that scripture has a literal meaning which is what the what the meaning of the author meant but then there can be alt other ways to apply the passage um you know I, I will say i'll just give you one classic example um the book of psalms whoever wrote those psalms was not intending in any way for it to be talking about a future messiah figure at all so like my god my god why have you forsaken me oh whoa like though i walk through the sh shadow of death or valley or whatever however you say that psalm i don't have the bible memorized but you know however you say those psalms those are very specific statements introspective statements about the person speaking it it's not a prophecy of the messiah but the multiple layers of interpretation 
you have the literal original intent, and then you have application where you could apply it to the Messiah and see there's some parallels here. Maybe maybe there's something deeper. But um, so, yeah, there's definitely opportunity for multiple interpretations, but there is a core one interpretation, which was the intended interpretation by the author, in my belief. Um, anyways, uh, that's, we're pretty much out of time now. So thank you guys for coming. Uh, Jackson, you want to close us? Sure. I want to thank you for being on here and, and for the rest of you. This is turning out to be a pretty successful little venture, and we appreciate it. Yes, let, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day, this Yom Kippur, where we have again afflicted ourselves to understand that our turning around back to you is something that is vital in our lives in order to keep us not only healthy in body, but healthy in spirit. Yes, we thank you. And as we go on through these days of awe and on to Sukkot, even though it's almost impossible to meet up anywhere. We pray that we might be able to be together through this remarkable online client and enjoy at least a little bit of the feast together. Now we ask until we meet again, you might pour out your blessings of long life on each one here. And next week, open our minds to being more patient with answers more definite with questions. And we want to especially ask your anointing on our brother Carlson, as he has been so faithful to interpret your words rightly for so many years. These things we pray in the name of Yahshua. Amen. Shalom, guys. Have a good, shalom, have a great weekend. Shabbat shalom. shalom.